Hello, my friends. Why did that do that? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. Oh, I can't believe it. Uh, it just, it doesn't quit. <laughs> I'll probably have to, you know, back up and punt when I get to that part now. Yeah. I had to close it just to get it around it. I don't know. I don't know why that was up there. I guess you could see that it was covering the screen. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's just not. E I wore the wrong shirt. It's just not easy being me. But then again, it is simple, but it's complicated. <laughs> and this is a pretty good example of simple but complicated this morning. Everything I've tried this morning has just went eep. Uh, crash and burn. That's pretty much. My, it's probably my next uh, t-shirt, Crash and Burn. It's pretty much what I've been doing lately. Well, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I feel like I've uh, been rode hard and put away wet. That's uh, an old country saying for what they used to do to horses. <laughs> In case you don't know what that means. <laughs> they would ride them hard and put them away sweating. And that's not a good thing, really. You're supposed to cool them off. But I kind of feel like that's the way I've been treated lately. <laughs> uh, as usual, we'll try to take some questions at the end. I've got, uh, you know, probably a short presentation on inlay because I, it's kind of, I, I can't get the technical side of this to work well so I can show you enough uh, about what I wanted to show you on inlay. And part of that screen covering my face there a minute ago was part of it so i'll have to probably call that back up a little bit later and you'll just have to bear with me and we'll see how it goes um there's a lot of folks online already 62 folks i wanted to uh first send out the you know prayers and best wishes to uh, jake jacobs he was here about two weeks ago stayed for a few days at our rental retreat and uh, i worked on an instrument or two of his i actually i take it back i he left an instrument here i was thinking of someone else he left an instrument here that i need to do quite a bit of work on and uh, jake uh said he was while he was here he began feeling ill and of course guess what he came down with we don't don't really even have to tell you do i he came down with the big c not the cancer one either it's the covid one and uh yeah he's uh, apparently on a ventilator uh, in a hospital at this point in time at least that was the status as of yesterday so my prayers and best wishes are going out to my friend Jake Jacobs there. He a uh, really nice fella and enjoyed having him here. And uh, one of the ironic things about uh, his visit was he was, you know, he was concerned about the guitar. It's a, a I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head and my, that's not a good thing. I think it was a J50 Gibson and, um, or J45 Gibson, something like that. Anyway, um, he uh, was wanting me to do a little bit of inlay work on it and uh, put JJ in uh, some place on the instrument. And uh, and the reason being, he's going it'll be left to one of his um, family, and all of their names start with JJ. You know, his name is Jake Jacobs, and I guess someone else in the family that will inherit the guitar. Uh, would have that same initials, so he wanted me to put that on there somewhere. And it's kind of ironic that he is lying on the, uh, you know, fighting for his life right now on a respirator. So, um, prayers and best wishes to Jake. Uh, moving on, and let's try to, you know, pick it up a little bit here so it's not quite so gloomy. Um, Mountain View, Arkansas. We're going down there uh, October 14th through the 17th to just jam and hang out. Uh, that's all we're doing. It's not a show or anything. We're, uh, we just go down there just for fun. And uh, if you don't know what Mountain View, Arkansas is, it's just a town kind of based around music and, and mostly it's 99% acoustic music. Uh, so if you've got an acoustic guitar, you want to come down there and just jam around, the, you know, with folks, it's a good time. We'll, we'll be down there the 14th through the 17th of October and uh, 
Typically, you can find us under the gazebos. And if you're facing the courthouse, the gazebos would be at the far back corner, or, you know, a, a block or so away, not too far away. And uh, the other place that we're often found is on the porch of the uh, bed and breakfast um, where a lot of folks, friends of mine, stay, which is at the other corner. And it's, I uh, can't think of the name of it right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. But anyway, it's right on the corner of the courthouse. Um, let's see. I've got a short, just a uh, video on a uh, machine that I built. Uh, you know, you've seen, most of you folks are tuning in for instruments and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, ironically, the machinery videos actually get more views. <laughs> I don't put out very many of those, but uh, they actually get a lot more views. Uh, my sawmill video, for instance, that I built, uh, you know, just... I just don't get those kinds of views on my instrument videos, sadly. But anyway, uh, I do have a video here, a short video of me using one of the machines I built, and it's the hydraulic brush hog that I built. And, and uh, basically, it was just a regular brush hog that I converted to, hide, to run on hydraulics, and I connected it up to the front of my bobcat. So here it is. Uh, Excuse me. The only thing I want to say is uh, watch close at the very end. You'll get a little surprise. Now, in case you're wondering, I saw the surprise coming all the way down this line, so there was no danger of causing any problems. So just, but just keep a close eye out. Let's see. Okay, well, did you see the little surprise at the very end there? Yeah, it was Peter Cottontail took off across there. And some of you may say, oh, you're destroying habitat for the animals. Well, sorry, I got, you know, 200 acres of habitat. And, uh, and actually, by cutting the weeds, it's actually good for the animals. Uh, you know, if you don't cut it all, you know, you cut certain areas and little sh new green shoots come up and they love that. They eat it, you know, like crazy. Um, you'll see deer and turkey and you know, the turkey come in and eat the bugs and the worms and things like that. The deer will come in and eat the new shoots. Uh, the rabbits will come in and eat the new shoots. So it's a good thing to cut down little patches. I don't cut it clear cut by any stretch. I just cut patches. And uh, that patch I cut there was probably a half acre, something like that. Um, I actually do it for the, for the wildlife, for the habitat. It's pretty cool. Um, but, uh, and by the way, the shakiness of that, if you don't know how a skid steer works, you're actually steering it down here with hand, by your hands like this. Well, I'm having to hold the camera in my hand, steer this thing with my wrist. So, I, yeah. And, and, you know, it's a rough riding machine anyway. So, you know, you were lucky to get what you got. <laughs> Anyway, I just thought you might get a kick out of it. That that brush hog thing, it really is awesome. It's it's amazing how the power it has. You can you can go up to a tree four four to six inches in diameter and just raise it up and and come down on the tree like that and just pretty much wipe it out. 
Um, and you might think, well, why would you want to do that? Well, again, you know, there's brush here on the farm and a lot of it's just brushy trees. And you just want to clean certain areas out, thin certain areas out all the time. I do it all pretty much for conservation, not as opposed to conservation. Um, and I do it, you know, a lot of it has been directed by Missouri Conservation, who is one of the best uh, conservation departments in the whole country. So anyway, I uh, thought you might get a kick out of seeing that. Well, another thing I wanted to show you here, um, I think that you're going to enjoy this video much, much, much more, especially since most of you are musical instrument types. Um, You've heard this song on the video many times. Uh, I just completed work on a guitar yesterday and I talked my daughter-in-law, Emery, into singing a song on it. Uh, now this was a uh, rebuild, if you will. Actually, Caleb did most of the work on this rebuild. I did mostly the setup on the rebuild. So here's Emery singing a song on a 1942 uh, 0018 Martin guitar. I came home from wandering and found my long lost friend. A friend who took one look at me and said, Girl, where you been? Well, I don't know that I can't say. wrote that song when she was just a young girl. Um, I don't know, she was, I'm going to say 16 or so when she wrote that, so in that time frame. And uh, just does a wonderful job. I mean, it, to me, it's amazing she could do that well live in front of a camera, you know, uh, compared to what you've heard in the past, which was recorded in a studio. So I thought that was pretty awesome. I got a couple of nice uh, comments there that uh, I, you know, thought I, I was reading while she was singing there. Um, <clears throat> have you ever harvested some of the sassafras roots for tea? No, I, well, yes, I have. I have actually made some sassafras tea in the past, but you know, I've heard so much negative about that that I just haven't pursued it. it I actually like it. It tastes good. It tastes a lot like root beer to me. <laughs> It really does. Uh, kind of smells a teeny bit like root beer. Um, 
it's much stronger flavor and, and smell though, I think. Um, it's really a neat smell. If you haven't ever smelled sassafras root, it's really neat. Um, yeah, and the other fellow says, I was expecting a young deer. I missed the bunny rabbit. Yeah, there was a Peter Cottontail took off across there, and it was, it was kind of fast. You had to be looking, <laughs> but he, 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 you could see it in the video. Um, someone get Jerry a camera gimbal. Yeah, except that I still need an extra hand, too, to hold it, or, or I'd have to mount it on something. But, yeah, it's a camera gimbal would be handy on something like that. I, and, uh, I, you know, I may, if I decide to do more of those kinds of videos, I may get one, one down the road. Um, let's see, uh, nice comments about Emery, um, I was just reading a couple of those comments because there, there was another one I thought I was going to address and I don't see it right now, but I can't remember what it was, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, let's go back into the program here, what I was going to talk about, okay, now that, yeah, and Mar uh, Mark uh, is watching, and that was your guitar, Mark, yes. And uh, it turned out really nice, got a nice sound and everything. Um, the, uh, I, wanted, I, I, just, I thought this would be, you might get a kick out of this, be kind of humorous. Um, yeah. Bill Monroe, he was famous for a lot of things, but one of the things, he had a few famous quotes. And one of his famous quotes was, that ain't no part of nothing. <laughs> you know, and I think what I think, if I remember correctly, and, and you know, again, the memory, who knows. <laughs> uh, but I think it was something to do with somebody in his band playing a song or playing something in a song. And he didn't like what they were playing. And he says, that ain't no part of nothing. You know, and so. And Bill was pretty blunt. He just kind of told it like it was. Well, here's here's uh, some stuff about that 40-ish uh, Martin guitar. That's what it used to look like. <laughs> and so if you want to think about it like this, this ain't no part of nothing anymore. <laughs> That's pretty much the truth. This thing was so hacked up and so messed up. I mean, see, like, even here, you know, it, it couldn't be. It just... You know, you could have put band-aids back on it. Yeah, you could have fixed this up, but it would have cost more than uh, than putting a new top on it. So we elected to just put a new top on it. And here's another part of Bill Monroe saying, that ain't no part of nothing. Why would that be in there? So the reason I'm showing you this is, is not, you know, apparently one of Mark's relatives in the past, you know, you're, decades ago probably did a lot of this uh, stuff here. So Mark, I apologize. I don't mean to point you out there. But, you know, people do this kind of stuff all the time. And I, I wanted to show this to, to kind of talk you out of it, if you will. You know, if you ever have the urge to just glue some random piece of wood up inside your instrument, fight it with all your being. Just don't do it. You know, um, you know, it, it, like Bill said, it just ain't no part of nothing. <laughs> so just don't do it. So that's my public service announcement for this morning. <laughs> and again, I, I apologize to Mark because I, I shouldn't have uh, even acknowledged what he said there so that you couldn't tie that to his family. I mean, but apparently somebody in his family had done that a long time ago. But uh, anyway, uh, just don't do that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, and, and Mark, and by the way, when we get to the video on that guitar and the replacement of the top and making the new top, you know, Caleb did 90% of the work on that. I did the setup at the end because uh, he was having a real trouble with the setup. And that kind of goes back to what I've said in the past. Building is one thing. Setting up an instrument is totally a different thing. And especially after you've done major work to one, which is basically like building a new one when you put a new top on it, it's just like building a new instrument. So, you know, everything has to be tweaked and adjusted and, and set up. And uh, so I did, you know, Caleb got it close, but he couldn't quite get it the last little bit there. And I, I 
finished it up and uh, then after I finished it then you know Emery could play it um, let me think here uh, I had a little email this morning I, I thought I'd just read this to you too um, this just came in just this morning so if you're in France and you sent me this email it's Jean or Jean I'm not sure J E A N I would say spell or pronounced as Jean or John um, anyway uh, he says I have two questions about my J50 from 1957 uh, I watched you know he's watched a lot of my videos and he noticed there was a split in the uh, in the plate and uh, the plate, uh, the bridge plate, I believe is what he's talking about. And somebody else glued another small plate on top of it. Uh, kind of goes to what I'm saying here, you know. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to doing that if you do it well. Uh, you know, if I, if, and I've even done it where I've, you know, fixed a, you know, some somebody wanted a, cheap repair they don't want to spend the money to do it the right way if you will and they just want it quick and dirty well I, you know I wouldn't be opposed to putting a plate over a plate if that was what really needed to be done to fix the problem but it should be done well and it should be used high quality wood etc and so forth um, so anyway he's he's asking you know is that a bad thing or is that dangerous well I think I kind of answered most of that it depends on how well it's done and if it's done well and done with the proper kind of wood then yeah it's probably fine uh, you'll probably be okay um, let's see here something about um, a brace there there is a missing brace a small one after the X brace at the back of the guitar I think it's missing a very long time. Is this dangerous? Well, it's really difficult to say without seeing which brace you're talking about. If it is one of the main X braces, I would say for sure that's a problem. Uh, if it's any of the other braces, less of a problem for sure. Um, the only thing I would watch is if you're seeing a deformation in your top in a case like that. Uh, if you're seeing a deformation in that area where the brace is, then definitely something needs to be done. If you're not seeing a deformation, then it's probably mostly just a um, tonal thing, and it probably won't even affect the tone much either. So you're probably fine. I, I don't think you'd have a problem, especially if it's been gone a long time and you're not seeing any deformation. Everybody has an opinion. That's mine. Um... Let's see, uh, we're about ready to start taking, no, not taking questions. We're about ready to get into the inlay discussion here, I believe. Um, the inlay discussion, I hope it doesn't let you down because I don't have very much planned on this, and it, it, mainly because it's difficult to really uh, talk about it live like this. So I thought I would just talk about it in some general terms, first of all. Um, you know, obviously, inlay, uh, to most people, I think they're thinking of the peg head and they're thinking about, uh, you know, mother of pearl and abalone shell. But there's a variety of things that can be used for inlay. I mean, you can use those things, of course, uh, but you can also use all kinds of wood, which is what I've kind of turned to lately. I, I'm finding that it's so pretty and it just does a nice job. It just... And if you work the grain of the woods properly, I think you can actually make a much prettier picture uh, with wood in a lot of cases than you can even with shell or abalone or that kind of thing. And it's, it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. And it looks elegant and it looks real rich. It looks uh, expensive, if you will. Um, you know, some of the shell looks, I mean, don't get me wrong, you can go to about any level you want to with anything in the shell. I've, some of the shell work I've seen in the past has just been gorgeous and beautiful and looks very well done and very expensive also. So yeah, you know, so it looks rich too. Uh, but I'm finding that the wood is, is a neat alternative and it's, and it's not done as much on instruments and, and it just is gorgeous. So um, most inlay materials are, you know, you, you, you don't, you know, in case you don't know, I mean, you're only inlaying a very thin wafer of material. 
And to give you an example of that, like, you know, a lot of this has been sent to me recently by viewers, and so I appreciate that. But I had a pretty large stock of, of different shells and things in the past. And just to give you some idea, this is like a piece of uh, mother of pearl that's been flattened out and, uh, you know, it's, it's been sawn flat. And you can, you know, put your design on here and uh, then saw it out of this and inlay it into your instrument. Say you wanted to cut a flower or something like that. And as a perfect example, this would be something I would use to cut out a rose, my rose outline of the rose logo that I use. And then after you cut that out, then you etch in the petals. And when I say etch in, I mean like you take an, a little scratch tool and scratch it in there. Um, I don't see my good scratch tool handy, wouldn't you? I didn't think about it. Yeah, wait a minute. I think I do know where it is. Uh, I thought I did. I don't see it. Uh, oh, there it is. <clears throat> this, this is one of the little tools that I use for scratching in design. And, um, Again, it's low resolution, so you can't see it, but it goes to a very needle point. I mean, just as sharp as it can be. And so if you get down with, you know, a magnifying thing or, you know, close glasses, whatever you need, or even a microscope, you can get down and, and do a very nice job of scratching your design in there. And if you go over the scratch a few times, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And then what I do then, is um, sometimes I'll fill it with uh, even like plastic wood, that little scratch, and then dye, and then put some black dye over it or whatever, and then it puts a, makes a fine line in there. And, uh, you know, saying that smooth or whatever, and then maybe I'll dye the whole thing red uh, for the rose, you know, and then that leaves kind of a red with some darker, you know, the, the petals be etched in a little bit more. And that, that, the leather dye that I use, the uh, Feebing's alcohol-based leather dyes, they're translucent. So the, the, the um, I don't know what you call it, the chatoyance, I guess you'd say, of the, uh, of the shell, and maybe you can see that a little bit there, that shines through the dye. So, you, so it doesn't hurt anything to put those alcohol-based dyes on top of this. Um, the only thing is you got to be careful is you can wipe those right back off a lot of times because that's a slick material and, and it won't stay on there. So what you need to do then is get it coated as quick after you get it dyed, you, get, you need to coat it uh, with lacquer as quick as you can after that. And if you don't, you know, put the lacquer on too thick, I mean, if you put it on too thick, it's going to run and run your dye and that would be bad. So you spray it on a nice thin coat to kind of seal it, another nice thin coat, you know, put on several nice thin coats and then that will lock in your dye on top of there. And it works really well. I've been doing that for years. So these are just, you know, talking points and tips that I thought I'd give you. Um, the, here is, uh, well, somehow or another, this got glued together. I don't know. This wasn't mine, actually. But this is typically kind of what you've, you know, after you cut out a bunch of pieces of shell, you, you're kind of left with a lot of things that look like this. The, these two pieces are actually glued together somehow. I don't know how they got stuck together. But uh, you end up with a lot of scrap material like that. And what you do a lot of times is uh, you save a lot of that, and then you can cut out the really tiny, like if you have a little tiny petal of, you know, leaf or something, you can cut that out of one of those little fragments. And so you can utilize your material, because they don't give this stuff away. It's pretty expensive when you go to buy it. Um, yeah, it's quite a bit of money per ounce. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's pretty expensive. I can't, I don't, I haven't bought any in a long time, so I probably shouldn't even try to quote a price on that. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a cheaper alternative, and I wouldn't recommend this ordinarily, but there are times when stuff like this comes in handy. For instance, this is a plastic that has a pearl look to it. And, you know, people call this mother of toilet seat, and that's kind of because from the 1950s, toilet seats were made out of stuff that looked like this. And so it's kind of funny, but that's, that's the truth, and that's what they made it out of is stuff that looks just like this. Now, you can use this for a lot of things. For instance, um, you could, you know, saw thin sheets out of this and use it for actual inlay. 
I don't recommend that. I really don't. But I mean, it, it depends on the instrument. And like if you're matching an old instrument that has cheap plastic inlay, then this is what you would want to use, you know. And um, <clears throat> but what you can use this kind of plastic for a lot of times is like uh, if you're building an F-style mandolin, for example, the uh, body points that come out to the the points there, and you the point protectors that that span the width of the side, they go right on those points. You can make it out of stuff like this, or you know you can get this in different colors and shades and things too. Um, so anyway, that's just ideas again, just talking ideas. A lot of your uh, inlay you can buy pre-cut. Now here's just dots. Those are just abalone dots and you can buy them in different millimeter sizes. Um, I'm guessing these are six millimeter. I'm not really sure. Probably about six. These are about uh, seven millimeter uh, uh, white dots here and these are uh, mother of pearl and then there's some really tiny uh, abalone dots here these are probably four millimeter I'm guessing um, then I, I've got some and as a matter of fact I'm going to show you the inlay here these are diamonds that someone actually sent to me and uh, I don't know if you can really see them there that I'm not going to try to take them out of the package because they just drop everything <laughs> Um, and then there's some finally some little uh, I don't know they look like snowflakes or flowers or something kind of so um, to give you a little bit of an update on the status of the last raw guitar in terms of inlay you know it's a parallel here I kind of talk have topics that kind of follow the last raw guitar I've got the blue tape on here to cover up the inlay name and that's sad because the inla the name inlaid is the pretty part of this. It really turned out beautiful. It really did. It, it's just gorgeous. But anyway, I just thought I'd show you. I've got the diamonds inlaid in there. Those are mother of pearl. And um, anyway, that'll give you some idea. I've just got, and I'm, I'm, the reason I have it in this jig is I'm gluing the binding on the sides here. And you can see how I've inserted... Uh, razor blades and picks, little thin picks uh, and stuff, just to take up space and put make the uh, binding really tight in this jig. Because every one of them is a little different. They never, none of them are exactly the same. You know, it, all my instruments are handmade, so they're all just slightly different. And this jig kind of fits them all as long as you add some spacers in there and things. Um, Here's some more of that uh, shell inlay. Uh, this is abalone. I just thought I'd show you a piece of that up close. Um, you know, it, it's got the color. This is abalone shell. And you can see it's almost, almost see-through. You can see light through it for sure. It's translucent-like. And uh, it's very pretty and very, when you polish it up, it's just gorgeous. And you can just get it in. I think abalone comes in what they call green and red. And to be honest, I can't tell the difference. I, being colorblind, I can't tell the difference. If I was guessing, I would call this green abalone. But then it, on the other hand, when I see it in the certain light, it kind of looks like it's got some red in it to me. You know, colorblindness is a strange thing. I don't see black and white. I see I see weird colors apparently but I don't see black and white at all okay so uh, and then talking about those kinds of inlay materials well then of course you've got just plain old wood and now this is some yellow wood and this is some white wood and this is happens to be maple this is the Osage orange um, you know and whatever inlay material you're using typically about 50 thousandths of an inch is kind of standard on the thickness of your inlay so and it seems to work well whether it's shell or wood or even plastic I suppose um, I, I have really not done much plastic inlay I think I've done a tiny bit of it over the years but just a very tiny amount um, so I can't really speak to that too much but on uh, on uh, your standard inlay like your abalone shell or your mother of pearl 50 thousandths is about right and uh, same way with your wood it works really well about 50 thousandths now um, some of you may say this is cheating um, but I have really turned 
most of my inlay work over to my laser cutter. Um, yeah, you can get these la laser cutters. They're called a K40 laser cutter, um, which I believe means they're 40 watt or yeah, 40 watt, I believe, not 40 amp, I don't think. Uh, I don't know. I think they're 40 watt. Yeah, 40 watt, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, um, they're all over eBay. Uh, if, you, if you just type in K40 laser cutter, uh, you can find them. I paid, I think, $319 for mine. Um, if you plan to do a lot of inlay work, it's a no-brainer. You need one of those things. I'm seriously telling you. Now, back up the truck and let me explain something. It's simple, but it's complicated. And I, it really applies to the laser cutter and the software and all that stuff. If you're good at using software and good at figuring computers and things out, then you definitely want to get one of those. If you're not, you better have a real close friend that's willing to spend a lot of time helping you because <laughs> it's not easy. It is not easy at all to uh, learn the software and the machine and get it all. And I adapted my machine a lot too because they don't come with any safety features. Um, so I put a kill switch on mine, uh, wired it in, and there's all kinds of videos out on YouTube that'll show you how to do these kinds of things. So you don't, it's not like I'm some kind of genius. I just found it on YouTube and figured it out, you know. And um, anyway, I put a kill switch on mine. So if you lift the lid, it instantly kills the laser, um, you know, because it doesn't come with that kind of stuff. And uh, I also uh, put a meter on mine because the, one of the important things about the uh, laser cutters is that it, it you don't want to burn it hot all the time. You, you want to try to keep it below 12 uh, milliamps, I believe is what, it's, what they call it. Um, and anyway, I put a meter on mine that registers the milliamps. And again, on YouTube, I found a video on how to do that and how to wire it in. And that's really been helpful too. Um, you can find all kinds of information about those K40 laser cutters out on YouTube. And to me, it is an absolute no brainer for the kind of money. I, it, you can't, I mean, you know, almost any tool costs you $300, any decent tool. And that thing is flat awesome. I'm not kidding. It really is amazing what you can do with it. And uh, I'm going to digress here and try to show you like an alternative use for it. Okay, this has got nothing to do with inlay, but I just, you know, it might get your mind going on what else you could use it for. So bear with me here because this was the technical part that's already failed this morning here and it's going to take me a second to get it going, I'm sure. Okay, I don't think, you know, this isn't working like I expected, but if you can see this, what, what's on the screen there in front of my face is called Inkscape. It's a software program and it's a free program. And basically you can draw up almost anything you can imagine in, in this program. And this program then convert, these images are converted directly over to the, um, K40 print uh, laser uh, cutter uh, software. So you can take these images directly out of here, put them into the K40 and cut these images. So what is this image here? Those of you who do mechanical things will recognize this as a gasket. <clears throat> well, just this weekend, I needed a gasket for my Bobcat. The, um, 
Let me see if I can, I guess I'll just have to kill the program to get rid of that. <clears throat> anyway, um, this weekend I needed a, to make a gasket for my Bobcat because uh, it had been drawing air in the fuel thing. And if you know anything about diesels, whenever you draw air into your fuel, it's not a good day. <laughs> you know, you, you're going to have to pump the air out and pump the fuel back in and all that. And it's a pain. It takes time. Well, this thing keeps doing that. I mean, it'll last a day or two the way it is, and then it draws air again. So I took it apart the other day, and I realized that it didn't have a gasket. So I thought, ah, where am I going to get that, you know, because you just can't go to the local auto parts and get that gasket for that thing. So I just measured it, quickly drew it up in Inkscape, put in a large piece of gasket material in the laser cutter and cut one out. It worked perfectly. Just worked great. And so my point is the laser cutter can be a tool for your inlay, but it can be a tool for so many other things too. <laughs> I mean, like uh, any kind of a gasket you need, any kind of a, you know, if, if you're cutting out anything flat, uh, you know, like you can actually, uh, well, as an example, here's some more things I made with it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I just, I just, put thin plywood in there and you can see here how that is a dovetail and I just drew that up and had it cut out all the parts and then I just glued it together with CA glue <laughs> real quick or maybe I used tight bond I don't remember but anyway um, I just made that little thing and I made several other ones too uh, you can make little boxes little drawers little things with the laser cutter with thin plywood um, it works really good and, you know, you, you, you could do those kinds of things with your bandsaw and all those kinds of things, too. You can, you know, you don't have to have a laser cutter to do that. But if you were going to do something that you're going to repeat and do over and over, the laser cutter makes it great because you just store the software and then just anytime you need to make one, you throw it in there and it works, you know. So the laser cutter is really cool. I, I just, I really can't say enough about uh, it for the kind of money. I mean, gee whiz, anything that you can get that's that cool for, you know, under $400, it's almost a no-brainer. But let me back up and say one more time, you got to be good with software and you got to be good with computers and understanding that kind of stuff. Because if you're not, you're probably going to be making a mistake by getting it. <laughs> so just be sure that you understand that. Um, you know, anyway. Uh, moving on a little bit further from that, um, you know, when it comes to um, inlay, uh, like for instance on the last Hara guitar here where I'm about ready to, to put some kind of a plate of wood over this, um, you know, I'll saw this thinner. This is about, I don't know, it's about a quarter inch thick now. I'm going to see if I can't saw two pieces out of this and then I have a piece of inlay to, I mean a piece of overlay to lay on this and then I'll inlay the design in this um, I'll take and lay this in the laser cutter have the laser cutter cut out the design in this or etch it either way I can cut all the way through it or and lay the pieces in there if the pieces are the same thickness um, so there's a lot of options with this and yeah, you can do all of that by hand too. If you choose to do it by hand, let me just show you the kind of saw you need. Let me get that real quick. As you can tell, I wasn't completely prepared for this. Um, here's just a deep cutting one. I, it's way, you know, overkill most of the time. But if you need to reach in deeply and, and saw something out, this would be good for that. Uh, this is the one I use most often now. It's spring-loaded. This has a little tiny uh, jeweler saw in here. Now, don't ask me what size these are because I don't remember. But they're just little jeweler blades and uh, you can tighten it down here and you, you kind of push it together tighten it down and then it the spring tension keeps the blade straight um, 
here's another example of that and this one's a little bit you know you might say more adjustable um, this one's kind of good but it's kind of bad too this one's so much simpler to use that's why i like this one better and one of my wonderful youtube viewers sent this to me uh, this one is made in switzerland i don't see a brand name on it or i would tell you wait a minute i do i think maybe there is one grober or grobet i'm not really sure what that it's hard to do. Let me just read that real quick. It's hard to see it anyway. G-R-O-B-E-T. Grobet is what it says. And it says made in uh, V-A-L-L-O-R-B-E Switzerland, if that helps you too. But that's a really good little saw. I like that one the best of all of them. And then of course you've got your standard coping saw. And Sometimes you need this too. I use this mostly for cutting out the F holes in a guitar or in my uh, mandolins. That's mostly what I use this for. These are more for cutting the actual pearl and things like that. Um, yeah, and you know, there's as many people as there are, that's how many approaches there are to doing inlay work. So there's no one black and white, you have to do it this way every time. Some other ideas that you can use is to, uh, you know, drop your design in a program, kind of like Inkscape, or, you know, you could use Photoshop or some other program, draw up your design, then you print it out on paper, and then you glue your paper to your shell, and then you uh, saw this out. You know, you saw the shell out, you, you can trace the paper um, lines on the paper with the saw then in the shell or the wood or whatever you decide to use for inlay. So this is the way I've done it for years until I got the laser cutter about a year and a half, two years. Well, it's probably been two and a half years ago now. Time gets away from me. I've had the laser cutter a while, maybe three years. I don't know. But uh, the point is, um, uh, you know, there's a zillion options. You, you, there's no one way that you have to do it, you know. I uh, think that's about everything I would probably cover on inlay this morning. I don't know if that made any sense at all or if it helped anybody at all. Um, but, uh, it, it, you know, it's just kind of an open book. You, you, there's no black and white, any rules on it, really. You just kind of can do almost anything you want to. Uh, some other ways of, like, getting the... Uh, um, paper, like if you print this out on a, you know, on a printer and then you stick, want to stick it to your uh, uh, shell or whatever, uh, sometimes uh, just a glue stick will work. Sometimes that comes loose, uh, but you know, you'll just have to experiment with different kinds of adhesives to uh, get it to stick. I found a glue stick is just about as good as anything, to be honest, because almost everything you try wants to come loose off of the shell. So, but you'll have to do your own experimenting with that and see what works best for you. Okay, let's go to questions. Um, I see some questions in here already, quite a few as a matter of fact. Uh, let's start at the top here. Have, have you ever put white paint under uh, the thin pearl inlay for light reflection? No, I haven't done that, but I don't think my pearl is thin enough that it would make that much difference. Um, you know, 50 thousandths is fairly thick and I don't think white paint under it would make any difference, uh, honestly. Um, it might if it were, you know, a lot thinner, it, I could see that. How, how do, how do is pearl binding done in your shop? I know Martin uses filler, they remove and fill the void with pearl. Um, yeah, well, Ed, when I do it, um, I've done, you know, pearl inlay or uh, abalone shell inlay all the way around mandolins. I've done it several times. I've done it around guitars. And um, at one time, I did use that filler strip. And I think I showed that in the last shop talk where I used this rubber filler strip to put it in there and then take that out and then put shell in that, in that slot that it left. That's almost more hassle than it's worth. I, you know, since I'm doing everything one off, you know, for me, I just take that individual piece of shell, cut it to shape, stick it in there, take the next individual piece, cut it to shape, stick it in there. Because you can't get one long piece of shell, you know, it's all little tiny strips. You can buy um, like shell binding inlay or whatever you want to refer to it as, purfling inlay, whatever. Uh, you can buy it in thin strips pre-sawed. And so what I do is I just take those 
they're maybe three quarters of an inch long and maybe they're 50 thousandths by 50 thousandths the other way. And I just take those and I'll maybe break them into even shorter pieces if I've got to go around a, a sharp curve and then I'll bevel the, the ends of each one of those pieces to fit together to go around that curve. And then I'll file off the outside jagged edges of them uh, to go around that curve. It's a process when you start putting shell around an instrument. Uh, yeah, it's not a five minute deal at all. Um, how they do it in the big factories, I don't know. I uh, really never looked into it. I just did it the way I did it and it's worked. I've done it on at least a half dozen instruments. I did it on the um, Carmen, Carmine D'Amico uh, 10 string mandolin that was in the uh, National Guitar Museum. And as I told you, uh, the curator of that museum called and said he had never seen a more beautiful instrument. <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he said. So that was pretty cool. Um, Okay, so that's the best I can tell you about that. Um, it's not simple at all. Alan Dust, what type of plastic acrylic do you use for, uh, okay, for that fretboard jig I just showed? Um, I was, just luck of the draw, Alan. I was at an uh, auction uh, locally here in town, and uh, it was a machinist auction. This guy had all kinds of machine. And wouldn't you know, I had to leave early. It was the best auction I've ever been to in my whole life. And uh, they, they were selling a bunch of this plastic, um, just thick type plastic. And I honestly don't know what it is, but I bought all of it. Hardly anybody else was interested in it. I bought everything. I, I had a whole trunk full of this stuff when I left. I mean, it was, I, and I even went over to the dumpster. I had seen people throwing it in dumpsters. And I went over to the dumpsters and dug it out. So I'm, I'm pretty low on the stock now, but I would call this uh, kind of plastic almost exactly like what uh, cutting boards are made out of in your house. Um, not much sticks to it. It doesn't glue good. Do I mean, you can't really glue it very well. So I have, as you can see here, I've actually got this screwed down. Uh, it's not glued. And uh, it, it does have a lot of flex to it, but I had some here, some of this was pretty thick, so I used that as the backer board and this. Um, the reason I chose this for, I mean, you can make this out of wood, you know, understand, but the problem is then everything you glue in it will stick. Um, the glue just sort of lightly sticks to this. It doesn't stick very hard. So you can pretty much get anything loose out of here. Um, I, even, even then, sometimes I'll put uh, wax paper through here and uh, keep the glue from getting on this. Uh, but I don't know what kind of plastic it is. I'd tell you if I did, uh, but I bought a bunch of this stuff whenever they were uh, ha at that auction. So that's the best I can help you with. Uh, pretty cool plastic though, and, and, and plastics are handy in the shop. I mean, I use them for a lot of things. Um, okay, the next question. What kind of lighting do you use in your shop? Do you prefer smaller bright lights? I, I use LED now, Clyde. I, uh, I had, uh, you know, the standard old fluorescent stuff. And uh, I had like, I don't know, in a, sp in a space this big, I would have had probably eight fluorescent lights fixtures, uh, you know, to get as much light as possible. I've only got four LED light fixtures. And keep in mind, they don't use near the electric, uh, but yet the light is so much brighter. I only have four LED fixtures in here, and it's bright as day in here, I think. I, oh, you could make a case that you could put a couple more of them in, it would be better. Um, there's no doubt about that. But overall, that's all I've got in here. It's just four fixtures in this roughly 22 by 22 foot square room and it, it does a good job now keep in mind these ceilings are a little higher too so uh, these are I guess close to 10 foot high ceilings so that gives the light room to spread out you know uh, if you had only eight foot high ceilings you might need the extra two lights that I was talking about for sure because uh, it won't you know spread as far out that uh, when it's lower like that but anyway, uh, they, they work really good. I really like the LED. I definitely would not go back to the fluorescent for at all. Um, and then on the individual work desk here, I have this LED light also. And uh, I pull it down. And it also has a magnifier in it so I can look through it uh, when I need to. It's very handy. Um, 
and uh, you know, L I really like LED light. It just is. It's just good. It's, it's, now there's different kinds of LED, by the way. Don't get the standard LED. Get the what I call the daylight. Are, are, and most of them are referred that way in the store too, uh, although you'll see different names. But daylight uh, LED is what I go for. Uh, it's much, much whiter, brighter light. Um, and, and honestly, you don't want that in every setting either. Uh, yeah, but in, in a workshop, that's exactly what I want. It works great for me at least. Um, Yeah, Mark said, great advice. He has been wanting a laser cutter. Yeah, I really can't even say enough good things about that laser cutter <sighs> with the caveat that it's complicated. It ain't no five-minute learning curve at all. You'll spend several days <laughs> figuring it all out, but it's worth it once you figure it out. It really is because it's not that bad once you figure it out. Uh, Having, you know, said everything I said about it, it is complicated, et cetera, and so forth. But once you, it's just like anything else. Once you know how to do it, it's pretty simple. Like for the average person out there, running that skid steer bobcat would be a real tough chore. But, you know, 15 minutes worth of instruction, you can do it, you know. Um, this probably going to take a lot more than 15 minutes of instruction, unfortunately. It's a little, a little more complex than that. But it is definitely worth it for the, when you figure the kind of money uh, that you're paying compared to what you can get out of it. Um, have you ever considered getting a 3D printer? We have a 3D printer sitting right behind this monitor that I'm talking to you on. <laughs> and we do use it, but it's, it hasn't helped us that much, honestly. Um, I'm a little disappointed with that. Plus, most things I've made with it, and, it's a, and we bought a good one. We didn't buy a cheap one. Uh, most things I've made with it just aren't that strong. Uh, I was expecting that plastic to be really hard and strong, and most things I make with it don't hold up. Um, having said that, some wonderful YouTube viewers sent me some stuff that was pr printed with 3D printer. And right now, that's the only example of it I can find, but it's just as hard as a rock, and it's just done really well. So he obviously knows stuff I don't know about the 3D printer. But anyway, it works uh, the 3D printer works pretty well. Again, it's a huge learning curve also. Just a huge learning curve. Uh, you know, for somebody who's very familiar with them, it's, it's not a problem. It's just like me. I, you know, I'm familiar with certain things and it's not a problem for me. If you try to do s some of these things, it would be a real problem for you until you learn how, you know. And that's the way it is with 3D printer. They're just complicated as heck until you learn how to do them um, and learn all the little tricks and you know, nuances. Hello from Canada. Could you cover plate and side thickness on acoustics? I planning on starting acoustic build. Uh, acoustic guitar, I'm assuming you're talking about. And um, yeah, yeah, you know, again, there's no black and white. I, I, you know, I would say just the rule of thumb or ballpark would be on your sides, um, I would say the thickest you would ever want to go on your sides is about 90 thousandths, and that's pretty dang thick. Uh, I tend to, you know, especially depending on the kind of wood, I tend to go down to about 70 thousandths. Um, you know, like if you were doing like curly maple, for example, uh, boy, you know, the thinner the better because <laughs> you're going to have your work cut out for you getting that to bend without breaking. Um, you know, so it really depends on the species of wood. It depends on your skill level too. Uh, you know, the more skilled you are, the thicker you can bend it. And uh, I'll admit defeat on that and just say that I like to go thin. <laughs> so it just, it works better. You have to obviously make up for that some other way. In other words, you may have to put some, uh, you know, like pieces out to reinforce the sides, which almost everybody does anyway, uh, so it's not like a big deal, um, you know, but you will have to do that if the thinner you go, especially. Um, the tops, the top plates and the back plates, um, on the back plate, uh, you know, depending on the density of the wood again, uh, I would say in the uh, 90 to 100 thousandths range uh, on, for most of your back plates on guitars, something like that. Uh, so for you millimeter folks, that's a uh, 
two millimeters, uh, 2.5 millimeters, somewhere in there. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, and then for your top board, <clears throat> I pretty much stick to about a hundred thousandths on the top. Now keep in mind you're using a softwood for the for the top, and uh, then all most all the, and someone asked a good question last week is why aren't the tops graduated on you know acoustic guitars like they are on you know mandolins and violins and things. And the difference is you're building a flat top guitar there. Now you can build an arch top guitar. Don't anybody get on me about that. Obviously you can certainly carve an arch top guitar. And in that case, you would graduate the top. But on your flat top guitars, you, most of your graduation is done in your bracing. And so, you know, somebody, a couple of people have mentioned they'd like to hear more on the tuning of those plates and things. Well. The truth is, I think I would probably disappoint almost everybody because I do it all totally by ear. And here's it in a nutshell, and I'll just we'll just go ahead and cover it. Um, yeah, I listen to it, you know, and I tap on it. And most of the time, when you're, it doesn't matter whether you're carving a a, a violin top or carving a, a mandolin you know, top or, or carving a guitar top with the a flat top guitar with the braces. When you tap on it, often you'll hear like a, you know, it's kind of like a, you, you hear a tone and it will ring, but it's kind of like two different, almost like dissonant notes or something. They're not really ringing in harmony, if you will. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not one note chiming together. It's kind of like you hear a couple of sounds at once. That's the best way I can explain it. I'm no technical guru on that stuff. And when I'm tapping on it, <clears throat> I start carving until I, you know, get that together. And, and all at once, when you get it, what I call get it right, it just kind of goes tong, and you just kind of hear it. Then you know you're really close. Then you start listening to your note. Um, that you're getting and you try to bring it to a certain note and typically you want to get it to a note that's not on your strings. It's not an open string. In other words, on a guitar you wouldn't want it to be an E, you wouldn't want it to be a B, you know, or a G or whatever. You know, you try to, you try to get it on something that's not an exact open note. Like a sharp or a flat would be good. Um, so you, you, and the reason for that, if you don't know, is you don't want it you know, like if you if you had your top tuned to a G and you make a G chord, for instance, the G chord is going to kind of be louder probably than all your other chords. That's just a, a dumb example. But your G string will probably ring outring the other strings. If you can tune that to say like a B flat as, as an example, um, then then your strings don't have a particular advantage. You know, uh, any one string doesn't have that particular advantage to ring louder than the others. And that's where people always say to my on my instruments, "Wow, it's got such an even tone." You know, it's it, you know, you know, it's it's not. I wouldn't. It's not a black and white science, but then again, it's not rocket science either. It's just kind of just common sense in a way. Um, common sense is not real common, obviously, because it's not something you're born with on, on understanding these things, but it makes sense to you once you think about it. You know, and so you don't want to have these sympathetic overtones and ringings on your instruments. So really, that's all it boils down to for me is I, I you know, I don't get all this technical crud with the st strobe tuners and all that junk. I wouldn't understand that anyway. I just seriously pick it up and I listen to it. And I'm going, well, that's better or that's not. That didn't help anything, <laughs> you know, because that's kind of the way it works when you're doing this, you know. And then, and then once, you know, in, you might say, well, then how do you regulate the note? How do you get it off of the note? Well, um, for the most part, um, if you want to make it a, a deeper note, um, you carve a little bit flatter uh, top. 
uh, you know, you, you know, you don't want a real high arch, like say in your mandolin or whatever. Plus, it will project better. It'll be louder if it's not quite so high. That's one thing. Um, if you want to make the note a little deeper, typically it seems like you carve it around the outer edges a little bit more. You thin out the outer edges a little bit more. And if you're wanting to car, you know, make the note a little bit higher, you can carve toward the center a little bit more. That's kind of typically how it goes. Um, you, but you can kind of notice your effect and then like check it with your tuner and see where it's at and then do a little bit more check it with your tuner. You don't do these things in big things. You know, in other words, you don't take your chisel and, and knock off that much, you know, wood. You know, you just a little bit here, a little bit there and you keep testing it, you know. And eventually you kind of see what's working and it... Um, that's the best I got. I, you know, I'm sorry, but, but at some point you'll get to the point where, you know, you... I also am, I'm always checking my thicknesses and my measurements. And I just happen to be fortunate and have the measurements off of a super loud F5 Lloyd Lohr mandolin um, that I took apart. So that was a very loud Lloyd Lohr mandolin and all my mandolins, surprise, surprise, are really loud, you know, um, because I build it to those exact specs. And uh, you can just kind of hear it come together. And when it comes together, you got to know when to stop. You know, it's like, wow, I think that's pretty darn good. I think I'll just stop right there, you know, and don't just keep monkeying with it, you know, give up after you get it where you want it, you know. But again, the key thing is try to land on a note that's not an open string. That would be my best advice on tuning your plates. Don't know if that made any sense to anybody or not, but I hope it did. Uh, okay, let's see here. What else? Um, What's the best way to get uh, binding channels perfect? Um, well, you know, I'll tell you the truth. It's not simple. It really isn't. Um, I, I really, you know, I don't want to do a commercial for Stumac, but I really like their jig. It's expensive. It's $300 or something or maybe more uh, for their... Uh, binding routing jig for putting the body in this thing and you slide it around and your router your router follows the perimeter that doggone thing's pretty good and that's about the best there is for the guitar for the mandolin whole different story yeah it ain't easy on a mandolin i don't care what you do how you think how good you think you are at it <laughs> it's not simple um Let's see here. I'm trying to find my different jigs. On a mandolin, this was the original thing they made for mounting to your uh, Dremel. And one side, it, it's slightly offset. And one side cuts deeper than the other side. Like this side here would cut a deeper, you know, you put a round, you put one of those um, round bits in there, um, kind of like this. It was designed to use one of these kind of bits. I don't know if that's showing up very well. But anyway, you put that in there uh, like so. It sticks through there, and then you slide this along. You put your finger on here, you know, which is real close to the cutter, and you're sliding that along the side, and it cuts the binding channel. The problem with that is, you know, when you get up to that scroll area, well, the scroll lifts, at least it does on my mandolin, so it's not flat. And uh, so it lifts, number one. And then number two, it also has an angle which cocks it out this way. So this thing gets, you know, it gets lifted, number one, and it also gets cocked out like that. So now your slot is cutting at an angle. Well, as long as you don't go too deep, that's okay. Uh, as long as you're not cutting you know, deeper than you want. Um, and then you have to just basically come back and finish it by hand. Now, you either have to do that with chisels, um, files, chisels, all those kinds of things, or if you're brave like me, <laughs> You know, uh, you just do it freehand with a, with a Dremel tool. And that's what I do. I, I used to not do that. I used to try to do it by hand. It just took forever. 
And so I just got good at uh, trying to find the right bit. This is my favorite freehand um, bit that I use. It's you might see it's got it's got spiral cutters that the, the it's got multiple ones. I'm going to say there's a half a dozen spirals around this thing, and it's about an eighth inch deal. So I'm just giving you an idea. I think I just bought these off eBay spiral uh, cutters, and um, anyway, so I, I mount this in here, and then I just I use it like a pencil. Now my hands are really big this way, and it, it for me this fits my hand pretty well. This is a pretty big, heavy router for. This is one of the bigger Dremels. This is a Dremel 4000, so it's heavy. It's a stout little machine, but it works for me using it like a pencil. Then I get whatever part it is I'm working on. I'll find you know I, I'll get against the table. I'll lay my arm on the table like this, and then I'll just you know and just. Very light. And that, everything has to be really stable when you start doing this. You don't get out here and do it freehand like this. It ain't gonna work. You get everything just as stable as you can. Um, maybe even take these fingers, put it against the workpiece to help stabilize it, and then you just kind of start erasing what you don't want to be there. And that's how I do it. I think of it like I'm erasing the wood, and uh, I, I may have to draw my lines in or something like that, possibly. Uh, whatever works for you, I pretty much just do it by the seat of my pants. Um, because when you go up around the scroll of a mandolin and you know go around, yeah, there's nothing you 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 know you can't really find anything that's gonna guide you very well. Uh, yeah, if you had a CNC router or something, you know, and you had this all hooked, up, yeah, you could do that. But I'm doing it by hand, and I'm doing them one at a time. That's how I do it. I, your results might vary. <laughs> if you happen to have a you know quarter inch trough across your scroll, don't blame me. Because <laughs> you know that's the thing about those bits is they grab and they pull one way or the other. And we're way past nine o'clock. <laughs> you get me going. That's the problem. See. Ah, uh, all right. Well, we still have 178 people on here, so I guess something's going right. So let's just take one more question here. Um, do I have a preferred package to add pickups to acoustic guitar? I think you're talking... Uh, for some reason today, it's... this. Oh, I, I know why. I don't have my particular thing up here. Um, now I've lost... I, uh, I don't know. Sorry. I okay. Yeah, I got my I got a different uh, chat thing going up here. I for some reason I had the wrong one up here and I couldn't see all the words. That was my problem. But now I can see it. Um, do you have a preferred package to add uh, pickups to an acoustic guitar? Well, I've said it many many times. I'm kind of an LR bags fan, and uh, pretty much anything that they have, uh, I'm for it. <laughs> you know. I've tried other ones. I'm not totally satisfied with most of the other ones. Um, one reason or another, and I'm not saying LR bags is perfect. I'm just saying they're very good. Now they're expensive. You know, um, they seem to you know have the high dollar stuff. But on the other hand, it seems to work really well. Anything I've put in from LR bags on an acoustic guitar, everybody goes, "Wow, that sounds awesome," or "That works so well." You know, so. I've just stuck with LR bags, and to be truthful, I don't have a lot of experience with the other stuff. So there may be something out there better now. At the time I started doing electronic stuff like that in acoustics, which is maybe 10 or 15 years ago, that was about the best there was. So anyway, and I've stuck with it, and it seems to work real well. Okay, that's about it. I'm no uh, electronics expert anyway. I thank you all for tuning in this morning. Um, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, if you think of a real good topic you want to uh, you know, see in a future shop talk or something, you know, pass it along, send me an email, whatever. Thank you so much for being here today. Y'all take care.